welcome back everybody so this is the third lecture for uh, eigenstate thermalization hypothesis uh, over to you Shogun. okay so thank you Shubham, and hello once again so uh, so in today's lecture um, uh, uh, i hope to cover uh, these things so yesterday we discussed mostly the classical theory for thermalization uh, ergodicity and mixing. So we'll see uh, how to generalize these ideas suitably for quantum thermalization. Um, and then like, what are the expectations your systems, uh, what do you expect? Uh, what features do you expect uh, to be present in the system in order to allow uh, quantum thermalization? And then I'll uh, introduce the main um, concept, which is the uh, I can say thermalization hypothesis or ETH. Um, and then we'll see some examples of some systems obeying ETH and uh, what are the operators that obey ETH. Uh, there was some discussion about simple operators yesterday. These will feature again. And then we'll see uh, how does thermalization uh, happen in intergroup systems. Okay, so we'll discuss something about intergroup systems. Okay, so uh, before I begin, so this is a one slide summary of the previous lecture. Uh, so we mostly discussed classical systems. We fix the energy, this corresponds to a surface in phase space. And the strongest criterion for uh, thermalization was mixing. And we saw that this implies ergodicity and it is a stronger condition than ergodicity. Okay, and this is the basic idea that you start with some initial distribution function and it diffuses out and uh, forms a uniform distribution at next times. Okay, so this is the idea that uh, it becomes a uh, constant at late times. Okay, and we saw that uh, the harmonic oscillator is an example of a system that is ergodic but does not obey mixing. And we also uh, discussed a bit about the Fermi pasta Ulam Singhal problem, in which uh, even adding nonlinearity does not lead to ergodicity. And we saw these examples of the stadium potentials, uh, which are chaotic or they have mixing, and uh, these are the ones which will have thermalization. Okay, so uh, uh, so the next uh, thing which we are going to discuss is how these ideas generalize to quantum theory. So we go from classical to quantum thermalization. Okay, so um, so there is no universal uh, definition of quantum chaos. So as was discussed a bit uh, in Survey's lecture as well as in Slack, that one can define quantum chaos in several ways. Um, and there is no universally accepted definition of what uh, quantum chaos is actually is. So one has to pick, pick a particular path and proceed along that path. And in this lectures, I'll try to do that. Okay, so, uh, so it is puzzling uh, actually uh, what, it, what uh, it actually means by quantum chaos it looks like an oxymoron because um, in because the equations uh, of quantum mechanics, so, so in the non-relativistic case, you have the Schrodinger equation, um, and it's a linear equation, and uh, there is non, no non-linearity in the system. So the time evolution in quantum mechanics is always linear. So we don't have non-linearity. So what do we mean, actually mean by quantum chaos? And uh, furthermore, it is uh, it is difficult to readily generalize the ideas from classical chaos to uh, quantum chaos because uh, we are not usually used to think in terms of a phase space in, in quantum mechanics. It's, the phase space is non-commutative uh, in quantum mechanics, so it's not, not a very clear notion. Although there are some formulations exist, uh, we are not going to take that route. And one possibility is that uh, quantum chaotic systems have some features of randomness. So that's the idea. And uh, let's see what we actually mean by this. So let's consider billiards again. So uh, we saw this example of a cricket stadium in which was circular. Uh, you had two degrees of freedom and uh, two conserved quantities. And this is an integral system. Okay, we saw this classically. And we also saw this uh, example of Sinai billiards in which you have this, uh, this shaded region is 
where the potential is infinite, the potential is also infinite over here. And if a ball bounces back and forth, its motion is chaotic or ergodic, or it always makes it, okay? So now uh, let's consider the same potentials, okay? And let's uh, try to solve the Schrodinger equation for a free particle in presence of these potentials. All right, that's what we do. So you can solve this problem and uh, solving the Schrodinger equation, actually uh, you can get the spectrum and you can plot the histogram for the energy level spacings, which is this. Uh, so which is this Delta J. So you get your spectrum, you sort it from uh, the lowest ground state to the highest uh, excited state. Okay, and you look at the energy level differences. So it's e, e, Ej plus one my, minus Ej is the energy differences. So it's called the level spacings. Okay, so this is called energy level spacings. So you get some data for the energy level spacings and um, you plot um, a histogram of the energy level spacings. And what happens is that um, uh, for this um, potential, which is the circular one, um, the energy level spacings take the form of a Poisson distribution, which is this. Okay, so it takes this form. Whereas uh, this, for this potential, for the Sinai billiards, it takes this form. And it's exactly what you have in the GOE ensemble. So we met the GOE ensemble in the random matrix lectures. And um, uh, quite surprisingly, if you uh, look at the energy levels of this system, and uh, you look at its histogram of the level spacings, it forms this, uh, uh, it, it obeys this uh, GOE distribution. So the idea is that the eigenvalue statistics of this uh, of this system is is exactly the same as random matrices. Okay, so this in its classical limit, yes, Madhu, I'll take your question. So uh, it, in, in this in its classical limit forms a chaotic system, but if you take the same uh, potential and solve the the analogous quantum mechanical problem. Its level spacings obey uh, the GOE distribution. Okay, so you take a random GOE matrix, I mean, and find its eigenvalues. Uh, the level spacings are going to have this form, and it obeys this. And uh, mm, mm, so the main uh, feature of this uh, of this distribution is that notice that for small level spacings, uh, yeah, there are very few uh, data points. Okay. So, which means that the energy levels cannot lie close to each other. So we saw in the random matrix lectures that there is this uh, log lambda i minus lambda j potential. Okay, so we uh, recall that you had this log lambda i minus lambda j potential, okay, in, in your random matrix integral, which actually prevents uh, eigenvalues to lie on top of each other. And that's the phenomenon of level repulsion. Okay, and we see uh, this level repulsion in uh, this case as well. Yeah, please. Yeah, here are questions, yeah. Uh, Akhil, do you wanna go first? Yeah, so, uh, uh, so should, I'm tempted to kind of associate the, uh, like this fundamental difference between the first and second to the, the topology of this region. Like, is that is that a nice way to think about it or probably yeah. not? Yeah, so that's a nice way to think about it if you like. I mean, you can also think of, like uh, classically, you can think of what are the conserved quantities versus the number of degrees of freedom. So in this so, case, uh -huh. so so that we are say, saying it in the second case. If instead of the square boundary, I had a circular boundary, then again the system would have been simpler, right? Yes, yes, and then it would be integrable again. Yeah. So it's not really that that the region has a hole or anything in that really made the difference. It's just the shape. It's yeah. So it's, I shouldn't it's, pay it's so shape. much attention yeah. to the. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, the topology itself of the region. Right, 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 right. So this okay. this breaks the U one symmetry, if you like, of the of the plane. Okay. Yeah. So so was the was the inside circle disc really circular disc really important or? Yeah. So if, if you remove, remove it, the inside circular uh -huh. disc, then um, then I, at least I think in the three D case, like if you have a three D box and you have hardcore bosons like balls bouncing off each other, this is a particle in a box situation, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. 
Yeah, so that, that, yeah, exactly. So it's a particle in a box, in which case your level spacings is uniformly spaced, right? So it's integers and it's uniformly spaced. So that's going to be something like a delta function. Yeah, so it's not going to obey this. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yes, Madhu? Yeah, so I just want to understand the, this point about uh, the level spacing, so the plot that you've done. Yeah. So I start off with this uh, square box with a with a hard hard repulsion center, right? And I solve the yeah, Schrodinger yeah. equation. Potential here is infinite. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And then I solve the Schrodinger equation, and I get yeah. uh, some energy levels, right? That um, yeah. uh, and and then what do I do with that collection of energy levels? Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm asking how I how, how do I bin them? Uh, what is the yeah. Oh, how do you bin them? That's up to you. But the uh, thing is, like, you get some data points, EI, okay? Right. And then from these data points, you can find this um, delta, delta i's, okay, which is defined uh, uh, over here below, okay, over here, okay? So you get this data points. So you get a bunch of these data points, and then you just plot a histogram of this. I mean, the way you bin them is up to you. I mean, how you can. Uh, it's how finely you bin them is up to you, but it doesn't matter. Okay, and, and and what this is telling me is that, yeah, what what, what is this telling me? I'm I'm trying to understand. So it, uh, I understand uh, when when the level spacing goes to zero, then there's basically no uh, there's no, uh, yeah. no delta j's. Yeah, there, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So which means that the eigenvalues cannot lie close to each other. That's that's what it is saying. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's what is that's one of the features of this distribution. But more importantly, the uh, the functional form actually is well fitted by this uh, 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 level spacing distribution for uh, for a GOE. Yeah. And it is a functional form, okay. which is called the Wigner Dyson distribution. We'll see in a couple of slides, and this is a good fit. Yeah. Okay. And and so what is the analog of the I, um, so when you say this eigenvalue statistics are the same as that of random matrices, um, you don't really mean eigenvalue statistics. You mean the the the, the spacing. Levels, levels, you can also do eigenvalue statistics. I mean, uh, so the eigenvalue statistics obeys the Wigner semicircle law. I see. Okay. And then yeah, that's that's also I think I don't know, uh, but 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 probably uh, let's say probably that's also. Going to I see. Okay. All right. Rito has a question. Uh, yeah, this is kind of related to this. I thought this uh, graph that you have, it's a distribution. So is the density of states with this, I mean, suppose you have a level spacing, then this uh, plot in the y-axis gives you the density of states. Is it not that? Yeah, so so the, in, in fact, I mean, you can relate this, uh, what what is here to, uh, to the density, which uh, actually Nitu talked about. So you can relate it to rho E1, E2, this is the connected density of states. I mean, uh, you know, of the of the. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so some kind of the density of states. That's what I was. Yeah, yeah. You can relate it to this. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, Akhil again. Hi. Hi. So so like this plot is also for some uh, some window of energy levels at probably which is higher and so on, right? Like, uh, ah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'll come to that. Yeah. I'll I'll refine this thing. Yeah. Just making sure like what are we yeah, yeah, looking at? Yeah. 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 Okay. This is and, just and in and in some sense, like uh, I would I would guess that like as you go higher or like slightly lower in the energy wind where the energy window is uh, meaned at the position, like the characteristics of the curve would also change, right? The curve yeah, would that, slightly that, broaden that. up. And, yeah. So I just have wondering, like, is there a like uh, how do you? Uh, so I'm just saying yeah. probably the mean yeah. variance and all are like uh, are a function of get, kind of get renormalized as you go up and down the energy. Right, right. So, so you can think of high energy states. It's reasonable. So in this uh, ETH thermalization context, we usually think about finite energy density states. So you can take the energy of the state and divide it by the volume and take the thermodynamic so, limit. If that is finite, then it's, yeah. It's, uh, so when you say high, you uh, how high? And like, if you go higher, it doesn't change. There's a conversion yeah, limit. So it's, I'm, I'm telling you, so you, you look at the ratio of the energy, the energy eigenvalue divided by the volume. Yeah, so, and that should be order one at least. Yeah. 
Okay, and and that there's the conversion limit. As you go higher, it is like yeah, or yeah, like yeah, 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 yeah. Or maybe oh, if you fix that to almost one, then you have a yeah. So one, anything one and greater, yeah, is going to work. Yeah. Uh, okay, is there a conversion thing? Like as you as you increase that ratio, it it the, this graph remains fixed, and the characteristics of the graph remains fixed. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think it just gets better with higher and higher energies. Okay, thanks. Uh, hi, uh, shall we? Yes. Can I make a comment uh, about yeah. this question from Akhi? That uh, so maybe you mean the same thing, but uh, by higher uh, energies, I would think that you want to be in the middle of the spectrum where the density of states is uh, uniform, because in a in a model which is not exactly like random matrix theory, you have very low and very high energies where the density becomes sparse. So I think the statement uh, is, is that the middle of the spectrum should be the right statement. And uh, that's one comment. And then uh, second comment, I wanted to say that if you if if we take only one, uh, yeah, I basically what I want to say is that if you do an ensemble averaging, then maybe you don't even need to be in the middle of the spectrum because by doing repeated instances of the solving the Schrodinger equation for some, yeah, I don't know, in, by introducing some disorder, then you would, end up uh, getting contributions from everywhere and therefore contributions of the the process of staying in the middle of the spectrum is also not needed but here i think you're not talking about enthermal averaging so yeah. going to the middle of the spectrum is also fine okay yeah just yeah thanks thanks yeah, that was a useful okay so i can go on uh, sorry i think uh, i think siddharth had a question uh, sorry show me yeah, I just had one question. Uh, uh, I think Akhil asked the same question, but I couldn't hear your answer because my internet is not very good. Uh, it, it, this this statistics you showed is it at higher energy levels? Yes. Uh, yeah. Or is it at? It yeah, so from this zero. is something which I would have expected, like something like. Yeah, you know, Lata this, gave this, a better answer. This, yeah, uh, so statistics it's, is saying it's true for high energy and not for low energy. Right? That's, that's yeah. Right. So I I think Lata gave a better answer i think she knows about this better than me so uh, um, is that if you look at the middle of the spectrum where the density of states is continuous uh, that's roughly the regime where this is supposed to apply we can discuss this later on uh, on slack okay is that is that all right uh, uh, maybe i should go on yeah okay so Okay, so uh, so let's um, consider uh, the spectrum of random matrices. Uh, uh, you're probably familiar with this already uh, from the lectures on random matrix theory, but this is just a, a short summary. Um, so so consider a random matrix ensemble. It can be a GOE or a GUE, and um, you can take one typical member of this ensemble and you can just look at the uh, distribution of nearest neighbor uh, energy level spaces, which is this, okay? So this was defined as delta in the previous slide and this is omega here. Okay, so this is the difference between the level spacings and you can plot this and it takes um, uh, the form of this wigner dyson distribution and um, the form of this curve is given by this, okay? I hope this is clear. So you can fit uh, with some parameters A and B. Yeah. So apparently this Wigner Dyson distribution is not known in closed form for arbitrary rank matrices, but for two by two matrices, one can find what the form is and slightly generalize it a bit and uh, with these parameters and uh, you can fit these things. Okay, so. Uh, Sorry, Shavik. Sure. Sure. What what was the thing about two by two? I mean, uh, I thought you you were talking about so, so large n on the matrix side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for arbitrary n or for large n, the form of the Wigner Dyson distribution is not known in closed form. Okay. So, but for two by two matrices, you can work out what the eigenvalue distribution is, and you can get arrive at a form similar to this uh, analytically. Okay. So you can now generalize some parameters appearing in that form, and this gives you this. Okay, so it's not known as of today. I mean, it's not known in closed form for okay. large or arbitrary random matrices. 
Okay, so, um, uh, so th this feature is very universal, okay? So Akhil was just asking about this rectangular box, okay? So inside this box, the potential is zero, outside the box, the, the uh, potential is infinity. Um, and uh, if you plot the energy levels, uh, it, uh, this is an integrable system and it takes the form of a Poisson distribution. Okay, so actually it's integer spaced, but there are actually three integers. One is to, uh, two integers, one is to keep in mind. And then if you plot the energy levels, it takes the form of a Poisson distribution. Okay, and then you can bend these two sides a bit into to, to a couple of arcs. And uh, these two sides are straight again. And, um, and then you get the GOE distribution uh, uh, again for the level spaces. All right, so uh, this points to an important thing that the random matrices play an important role uh, in, in thermalization, because this is an example of a chaotic, uh, chaotic system, and uh, probably random matrix theory uh, might enter the story. Yes, okay. Is, th is there a parametrized way to see like how how fast and how drastically this thing folds like because it's like a drastic change right like if it's yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. The... yeah 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 so in some systems uh, you can change some parameters so i don't know a universal description i don't think that exists but in some systems for example uh, i think uh, if you if you take some quantum system and then change the value of the magnetic field from zero to something finite, you can slowly see the transition from Poissonian to- Yeah, infinite. but I, I, I mean, something like this simple thing, like you st start with the particle in a box, but you slightly change the box and yeah, yeah, then- Yeah, 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 yeah. There, there should be some way to do that, yeah. yeah. I see. Yeah. All right, so this is something which is very universal. And uh, uh, so here is another fun example, just to, <laughs> see how universal this is. So these are time differences between bus arrival times of a particular bus in a particular route, route number four, in the city in Mexico, okay? So uh, you uh, fix a particular location, a particular bus stop, and you look at the differences between bus arrival times. Okay, and uh, surprise, surprise, it uh, actually fits this GUE statistics. Okay, and so there is level repulsion over here. Okay, so, and this actually makes sense from an economic viewpoint because if the uh, buses came really close to each other, I mean, as if the arrival times were short, you wouldn't get enough passengers in your next bus and thereby you wouldn't uh, get uh, some profit. So this is a privately run service and the idea, as we saw in one of the lectures in the discussion sessions, is to maximize profits. And uh, if level repulsion exists, and th this gives you a chance of maximizing profits. So this is like a chaotic uh, thing. But if you uh, consider some, um, some like very well-organized places like Japan or Switzerland, maybe this is just a Delta function. It's not <laughs> magnetized. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, so this is just a fun example. It depends on you whether you want to take this seriously or not. But you know, it just shows how universal this uh, RMT uh, behavior can be. Yes, Siddharth. Uh, hi, hi, thanks for this fun example. Uh, and sorry for my disruption earlier. There's some internet issues. I couldn't hear your answer, but I'll I, I look at it in the video later. But can you? I cannot hear you. Siddharth, we can't hear you. Um, maybe, maybe Siddharth, you could type in your question and then I can read it out. Is that okay? Yeah, I th Shavik, let's, uh, why don't you go ahead? I'll, I'll coordinate. Okay. I think his question is why GOE in particular? Uh, so uh, I think the experts in the audience can answer this question better 
than me, so uh, maybe need to or, or go. So I think there is some issue, uh, there is some thing about time reversal symmetry. If time reversal symmetry is absent, then you, uh, then it's the GU, GUE, otherwise it's the GOE, yeah. But uh, I don't know, maybe Orgo or Nitu, if uh, you're present, you can give a better answer. I have nothing good to say now. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. If I have some answer to that, I will come up and put in Slack. Sure. Yeah, I don't have a better answer. Okay. So, any other questions? No, I think you can go ahead. Okay. So, um, how can um, we go from the classical regime to the quantum regime? Uh, more generally, what can possibly be a universal description of this? Okay, so there are two conjectures, one by Berry and Tabor and another one by BGS, Bohigas, Giannoni and Smith. So the first one by Berry and Tabor says that if the classical dynamics is completely integrable, so which is like if you have a square box and the potential outside the square is infinity, so it's particle in a box, the corresponding quantum energy levels have Poisonian statistics, as we saw in, in this example, that uh, uh, if you have, uh, if I go back, so over here, so this is an integral system that obeys Poisonian statistics. And on the other hand, this is a chaotic example in which you have uh, this GOE uh, distribution that fits it. And um, uh, so the other uh, conjecture is by um, BGS, it says that if a classical system is chaotic, then the corresponding quantum energy level, so you take the same potential and solve the quantum problem, which is solve the Schrodinger equation with the same potential, um, it has the same statistics as that of random matrices in the limit of high energy levels. Okay, so that's the conjecture. There is a question by um, Akhil, I think, or something, I don't know, yeah. Yes, yeah, I had a question. So like maybe since you gave me the chance, I will ask it. So this first conjecture uh, is should I understand that all integrable systems are like a collection of equally spaced states. So integral system is generally like a bunch of equally spaced things put together and hence that goes to a Poissonian like have you mentioned that uh, the 2D have 2D box goes to a Poissonian is that the intuition? Yeah, if it's exactly equally spaced, then it should be a delta function, right? No, no, but you said still the two, uh, two, yeah, two yeah, dimensional yeah. particle in a box went to a Poissonian, right? Because there are two yeah. different levels. Well, it's integer spaced rather than equally spaced. I think that's the correct word to use. Oh, okay, so bunch of bunch of a bunch of separate things put together, but all of them are integer spaced, and then it goes to Poisson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah. So Rohit, uh, do you have anything to say? Okay. No. Okay. So these these are two conjectures. So this is from for the integrable systems how to go from the classical to the quantum. Uh, this is by Barry and Tabor. So actually, uh, this work was uh, partly done in Bangalore. Uh, so it was at a time when Barry was. Uh, uh, visiting IISC on a sabbatical. So if you want to look at this paper, you'll see that his main affiliation is with the physics department. Okay, so, okay, so um, how can one um, possibly proceed? Okay, so we saw that uh, chaotic quantum systems have a, a random matrix uh, uh, like spectrum. So it obeys this wigner dyson statistics. So it might then be valuable to uh, approximate the quantum Hamiltonian of the system by a random matrix, okay? So, uh, so this is a Gaussian ensemble. We pick one member from this ensemble and declare that is, that's the quantum Hamiltonian of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the system, okay? So we are, um, uh, we fix the symmetries in such that this have this uh, random matrix should also has have those symmetries and so on. I think this is going to fix whether geo whether you work with GOE or GOE or any of the other ensembles. This was one of Siddharth's questions. Um, 
but the essential point is that uh, we are approximating the quantum Hamiltonian by a random matrix, and uh, thereby we are abandoning the search for an exact solution over here. So this is not exactly what we do in, in physics all the time, that we are, our main goal is to arrive at some exact solution to some, uh, to some problem, but we are abandoning that approach and we're adopting a statistical approach. So in a sense, this is uh, like using the principle of least bias in the sense that you're working with a random matrix, which is supposed to have those features and it should be able to explain um, some of the properties which the systems should have in order to determine. Okay, so this is um, also along the lines of what uh, Wigner actually did in order to describe the spectrum of heavy nuclear, that a sufficiently complex system with a large number of degrees of freedom can be described by random matrix. Okay, so that's, that's the, um, uh, like the philosophical uh, uh, idea behind this, this approach. Yes, uh, Arpita, do you have a question? Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes, reciprocal. Yeah, I means uh, you said that uh, we are equating kind of this uh, uh, non-integrable systems with the random matrix model, but is it sufficient just to look by the this density distribution and say that the two systems are equal? Because typically yeah, yeah. So quantum yeah. mechanics. We are not saying that the two quantum mechanics. Are equal. Yeah, we are not saying that the two systems are equal. But uh, I'm saying that you know there might be some features of random matrices which your chaotic system also shares, like they have something in common, and thereby like some of these features can be explained by uh, by using random matrix theory. So that that's it. Okay, okay. Means uh, yeah, means fi so finally we'll kind of co compute the correlation function and right, right, check right. the consistency with chaotic. Right, 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 right. So uh, also I should say that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the ETH is not like a lemma or an axiom, it's a criterion. Okay, so you uh, come up with some general set of rules and then you verify whether your system, say suppose your 2D CFT or uh, the 3D CFT, whatever, whether it, it, it meets this criteria. Okay, that's how you do it on a case by case basis. But you try to come up with some general set of rules which uh, your system should obey in order to turn that. So that's, that's the yeah, motivation behind it. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, so we, as I said, we can approximate the Hamiltonian by a random matrix. And actually it's quite easy to generate random matrices in Mathematica. And uh, for example, you can get a GOE matrix of 500 by 501. This. And you can go ahead and do some calculations. So I, I actually have a mathematical file which realizes some of the statistics and uh, tries to arrive at ETH from RMT. Maybe I can share that uh, after the lecture. But yeah, maybe, and you can also play around with, uh, with it a bit. Okay, so um, let's now look at the eigenvectors of a random matrix. So uh, for large random matrices, the eigenvectors are random orthogonal unit vectors in any basis, okay? So you can, uh, uh, so these are two eigenstates of your Hamiltonian. Um, so it's a D by D Hamiltonian. So this D will keep appearing. So this is like a large D matrix. And these are the components of, uh, of the eigenvector. And the statement is that these numbers appearing over here are random numbers. And they obey uh, this condition that within the same eigenvector, if M and N, they click together, if they are the same, then uh, they equate to this one. Okay, so that's, that's uh, so this is a statement about the variance, if you like, yeah. which is goes as one over T. Okay. So this uh, over bar, it indicates the ensemble average. This is the ensemble average over your matrix ensemble. And similarly, you can look at higher point uh, sort of uh, combinations of this um, of these components appearing in your eigenvector, and you can find the ensemble average of these quantities. And um, as was taught by Nitu, 
Uh, you can find these by using wick contractions. So, uh, so the, for the fourth, if you have four of them, there will be three possible uh, wick contractions. So uh, you can, uh, yeah, so one is this and this, you can have uh, this and this, and uh, you can find it this and this. Okay, so these are three ones. Okay, so it factorizes into products of uh, two point functions, if you like. And actually, uh, you can like uh, forget about the random matrix Hamiltonian uh, to some extent and use this as your starting point. And that's what Berry's conjecture does. Uh, it says that the eigenvectors or the eigenstates of, uh, of a chaotic system, um, uh, they have these components uh, which obey this condition. Right. This is clear. Okay, so what now, is this? What is the statement of Berry's conjecture? Yeah. So the, uh, roughly, the statement of Berry's conjecture is just this. Yes. Okay. All right. That for a chaotic system, you look at the um, um, eigenstates and you look at the components of these eigenstates, and if you take an ensemble average, yeah, it has. Uh, I see. Okay. Sorry, uh, Shavik, what's M and N uh, did you say? Yeah, so M uh, indicates, so this is the m -th eigen eigenvector, and this is the m -th eigenvector, okay? And this I and J are like the matrix index, okay? So if you have a 500 by 500 matrix, then I and J, they run from one to 500, and M and N are, you know, the m -th eigenvector. Yeah. So the hundredth one and the hundredth one. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So uh, we looked at the eigenvectors or the eigenstates of the system. So now let's look at operators. Eventually, we are interested in calculating correlation functions. So let's look at our uh, operators now. So let's look at this operator O, so which is this. So it has its eigenvalues. Uh, uh, yeah, so its eigenvalues um, are OI, okay? So, and these are the eigenvalues in the Cartesian beta. This is, uh, you can write this operator in the Cartesian basis, okay? The eigenvalues remain invariant. So you can write the eigen, uh, the operator in this way. So in the Cartesian basis, um, which is this, okay? So I is like this, and then whereas your random matrix basis or the basis of energy eigenstates is this. Okay, so in this Cartesian basis, this is a diagonal matrix with these values. All right, so this, uh, these are the eigenvalues. So now this is diagonal in the Cartesian basis, which is this. But what about the matrix elements in the basis of energy eigenstates? So that's what we are interested in calculating. Okay, so we want to know what are the components of, um, of this uh, operator O, the, the matrix elements of these in the basis of energy eigenstates, okay? So we can find this, so it's a simple thing to do. So you uh, insert, um, you first write it as this. And so you substitute this over here. And then uh, this mi and in are nothing but uh, these. Okay, so it's a simple thing to see because you're uh, in the Cartesian basis, the first element is just this, the second element is this, and uh, thereby these overlaps are given. All right, hope that is clear. Okay. Uh, is there yes. uh, a orthogonal, is there a, an assumption of GOE, or orthogonal class here? Uh, yes, yes. So, yes. Thanks. yes, thanks for reminding me. So also this in slide... the previous slide. Yes, 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 yes. So these calculations, yeah, I, I should have said this. Um, uh, yes, so these calculations which I have right now and in the next few slides, this this will apply for the GOE. Yeah, for GOE, some numbers actually change, but it, the, essentially the calculation proceeds in the same way. Yeah. And so um, since you have complex things over there, you should replace by things by star and like psi star psi. Uh, but yeah, I'm working with the GOE, the GOE where everything is real. And uh, yeah, so that's what you have. Thanks. Okay, so let's calculate what is the mean. Uh, we are 
eventually interested in statistics of these uh, <clears throat> observables. So let's first calculate the mean. So we saw from the previous slide that um, the matrix elements are given by this. Okay, so let's, and we, uh, or Barry's conjecture told us that these components of the eigenvectors are obey this average. All right, so you can um, simply take the average, which is just uh, putting bars on, on in this equation and uh, use for this, just use this equation and this is what you get. Okay, so which is the sum of the eigenvalues of the operator. Okay, so this is just the boring trace of the matrix and it remains invariant on the change of basis, so nothing new here. You can also look at the mean of the off diagonal elements. So this is the mean of the diagonal elements. This is the mean of the off diagonal elements. And um, once again, you, since these things do not click for M not equal to N, you're going to get zero. So, okay, so, of the, so the mean of the off diagonal elements is actually zero. Okay, so now we found the mean. The next thing to do is, uh, what happened? I can't see your screen now. Uh, yeah, I didn't do anything. All of a sudden it uh, stopped. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, this is, uh, this computer is doing things by itself. I mean, I, <laughs> I'm not doing anything. Okay. Um, okay, so everything looks fine. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, you can see my slides and my pen location. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, uh, so, so now let's look at uh, the variance, okay? We calculated the mean, now let's try to look at the variance. Okay, so the first, let's start with the diagonal matrix element. So this is the uh, mean of the square minus the square of the mean. So that's the variance or the square of the standard deviation, if you like. And it is simply uh, this. So just use this definition, okay? And write it twice uh, with two different uh, summations, i and j, uh, and this is what you get, okay? So just this over bar is because of this ensemble average over here. All right, similarly for this uh, square of the mean, again, it's a double sum, but you have a disconnected average because it is a square. Okay, I guess this is simple enough. So if there are any questions, please, please feel free to ask. Um, okay, so this is what we have. In the next step, let's separate out the terms with i equal to j and i not equal to j. Okay, so that's, that's what we do. So, so the terms with i not equal to j, um, these are these terms. Okay, so if i is not equal to j, then this, this thing is, will actually factorize because it is going to click only amongst this and this. Okay, so it's uh, you have this and this. All right, and for this, it is already factorized. So you have this and this. I hope that is clear. And uh, what you actually have is that uh, these two terms are same. So they cancel each other out. Okay, so now with the terms i equal to j, uh, what you have is this uh, four, uh, this this average over just four components, and this is already this factorized thing which comes from here. Okay, so now it's uh, when you have four, you can just use weak contractions as we saw. So that's one of them is this, uh, another one is this, and uh, another one is this. Okay, and so there are three possible combinations. Okay, and uh, so. That's why you have this factor of three over here. And uh, since we did weak contractions, it factorized into kind of two point functions, which is this. Okay, and this, and from here, you have this same term and with a factor of one. Okay. Next step, we have this average. You can use the Berry's conjecture, which is this. You can substitute this thing over here and Finally, you end up with this. Okay, so over here, I've used a definition that this one over D times uh, this average of eigenvalue squared. Okay, so this is the average of the square of eigenvalues and this is given by this. Okay, is that clear? 
<laughs> that is clear. But what this says is that you have this suppression by one over G, okay? Which means that the fluctuations are actually suppressed. If you have a large uh, random matrix, um, then this is one over N. So the fluctuations about, about the mean or diagonal um, matrix elements, it's actually suppressed by one over T. That's what this says. Okay, so it's, it's, it, it was useful to rescale things in this way because this is an order one quantity because you have this I actually runs from a one to one to D, okay? And these are all positive, okay? So, and you divide it by one over D. So this is an order one quantity. And so this suppression is by uh, uh, one over D. Okay, fluctuations are suppressed. Now you can do the same thing. You can find the variance for the off diagonal elements. Um, it's a bit simpler than the diagonal elements because uh, uh, of the weak contractions. Uh, so, uh, so if M is not equal to N, these things are outright zero. Okay, so that because of this relation. Okay, so next uh, uh, you can contract these two things. Uh, you basically use this relation and you get two factors of one over D with these chronic deltas from this. Okay, so again, you have average of four uh, components. This factorizes into averages of two pairs of two components. Okay, and then what you have again is this, just like what we had in the previous slide for the mean uh, um, of the diagonal matrix elements. Again, you define this as this, and once again, this is again one over T. Okay, so this is suppressed again. Yeah, so once again, the fluctuations are suppressed. Okay, so problem I have with my uh, iPad again. So let's see if I can fix it. It looks like your cursor is stuck. Is that it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so uh, maybe. Huh. <laughs> so uh, a bit strange. So um, yeah, let me just stop this. And, um, sorry for this glitches that happened also yesterday. Okay, so what I'll do is to try to join from uh, Zoom um, to my iPad. Can you pause the recording? <clears throat> All right, so, uh, so we saw that the uh, variance of both the mean and the, uh, uh, of the both the diagonal as well as the off diagonal elements they are suppressed by one over G. So uh, what you have for your um, matrix elements of an operator O is that the diagonal elements are much larger compared to the off diagonal elements. So the mean of the off diagonal elements is zero and the fluctuations are one over N. So you have some non-zero values because of the fluctuations. But for the diagonal matrix elements, it's, it's actually smooth okay? since, the, since it is Close, it is very closely, uh, sharply peaked about the mean since the fluctuations are small. So it's the diagonal elements are smooth and it's much higher than the often. So that's, that's how uh, uh, this happens. Okay, so to summarize, um, for the diagonal elements, the mean was essentially given by the trace and it's, it's this. Whereas for the off-diagonal elements, um, the mean is zero and the variance um, uh, of both the diagonal and the off-diagonal elements, they are suppressed as one of 30. Now while uh, doing this, we assumed that O is a light operator, that the eigenvalues, um, uh, that its eigenvalues do not scale as the size of the matrix. Uh, so this is an assumption which is made, uh, so uh, yeah. So this is uh, maybe uh, 
simple operators uh, uh, they obey uh, yeah so simple operators they they obey this inequality any questions uh, or comments okay I can go on. okay so um this uh, these properties of the mean and the variance um, imply that the individual matrix elements of this operator O, they can be reproduced from this ansatz. Okay, so if you take um, OMN uh, to be um, an identity matrix times the um, uh, times the average of the diagonal elements. Okay, so that's the leading term, if you like. There is a subleading term. Uh, which contains um, the square root of the variance, essentially, okay, times a random matrix. Okay, so these are some random variables. RMN are some random variables. The mean of these are zero, and the variance is two for the diagonal matrix elements and uh, one for the off diagonal matrix elements. Now, what you can do is to take the mean and variance of this object using this ansatz. And you're going to reproduce this, these two things. So all these features get gets reproduced from this ansatz. Okay, is that clear? So this is an important point because uh, we'll see that ETH actually uh, grows out of this. It's a slightly mature version of of this of this statement. What about higher moments? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, right now uh, we don't care. So uh, uh, higher moments are going to be uh, dependent on the specifics of the theory. It's hard to make universal statements for them. Yeah, right now we, we, we cannot say anything. Yes, Akhil. So could you say a bit more about this RMN? Does it have its own some distribution and so on? Is it a derived object or is it just like symbolic at the stage? Yeah, it it just obeys these two properties. That's it. That's all you need at this stage. I mean, that's yeah, yeah. I don't have anything for it. Yeah. Okay, so we arrived at this ansatz for the matrix elements of this operator O, and we got to this point by averaging over an ensemble of, of Hamiltonians because. Note that we took the averages, the over bars indicated ensemble averages. Okay, so, so a typical member of the um, mm, random matrix ensemble, it's very likely that if you measure an operator and if you take an operator and look at its matrix elements, it's going to obey this, this, this answer. Now, um, notice that um, mm, uh, the entropy of your system is, uh, is the log of the number of uh, microstates. Okay, so that's the um, uh, so D is the rank of your matrix. Okay, so the entropy is uh, can be thought of as the log of the number of high energy states. Okay, so since we are at high energies, so one over square root D, which is the combination that appears over here, uh, that is essentially e to the minus s by two. Okay, so this part over here you can write it as um, mod O squared times e to the minus s by two times R mn. Okay, so you can rewrite this thing in this way. So we are looking at high energies at the description. We are trying to describe the system at high energies where um, the entropy is given by this. And uh, yeah, you can write this uh, as, as this. And this ansatz uh, over here, uh, once you write this in terms of the entropy, I mean, this is very close to ETH. I mean, this, this actually forms the core of the eigenstate terminalization hypothesis. But we saw over here, but there is a very explicit way how to arrive at it. So we started with the random matrix, looked at its eigenvectors, then we considered an observable O, and then we looked at the matrix elements of this observable in the basis of energy eigenstates. And from there, we arrived at this. 
Uh, sorry, Shravit, can I just have something that, uh, what is, yeah, you said it, but what's, what's the various conjecture again? Because this formula that you used, isn't it a property of, if we derived it all for random matrix theory, then isn't that a property already of random matrix theory and, uh, or the various conjecture is about properties of random yeah, matrix theory? Yeah, it, it's just a way of thinking. So, so various conjecture says that, um, 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 so that, he, okay, so let's look at, um, this, uh, oh, okay, let's look at psi i m psi i m and the average of this and this I said is one over t um, delta m n delta i j. Okay, so now Barry's conjecture takes this as the starting point. Okay. It doesn't approx it doesn't do the job of approximating uh, the Hamiltonian of your system by a random matrix. It, it, that's not the starting point for Barry's conjecture. Barry's conjecture is this. So, whereas if you started with random matrix theory, you approximate. I mean, your Hamiltonian is a random matrix whose eigenvalues obey this property. So it's just a different okay. starting point, but essentially it leads to the same thing. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I think I come to an end of this part. Yeah, so maybe uh, it's a good time to uh, uh, have some questions and discuss a bit. If there are none, I can go on. Okay. Seems uh, there are no questions. Uh, so I move to, on to the next topic, which is uh, quantum thermalization. So we'll use most of these ideas in order to formulate, to formulate the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. So this is a reminder from yesterday that what is the working definition of thermalization? So we start with a generic initial state, which is this. It's a linear combination of energy eigenstates. And you want this, uh, if you want your system to thermalize, it's good to keep the superposition uh, as a sum over states within a small window of energy eigenvalues. Okay. So, and then we say um, our observable has thermalized if the expectation value of this operator stays close to its value in the canonical ensemble at most late times. So it's, it reaches, finally reaches the thermal expectation of the observable. Okay, so we are, we are interested in this quantity. We started with some initial state, we decide, and we want to track the time evolution of this. Okay, so this is a sum over states within a small energy window. And, um, okay, so it's just a Heisenberg evolution. You can write O of T in this way. Okay, that's a simple thing. And then again, use this definition. And this is, you have a double sum, which is this. All right. Okay, so now uh, let's try to, we'll look at the long time average. So let's try to uh, separate out the sum into diagonal terms. So these, these are terms with EM is equal to EN. So this phase actually goes away. So this is this. And you have some off diagonal terms. Okay, which is EM not equal to. Okay, so it just, just follows from this. If you separate out the sum with M is equal to M terms and M not equal to M terms. Okay, so this is a constant piece. So it is like, it does not depend on time. Whereas uh, all the time dependence actually sits in the off time of terms. So, yeah. Now let's look at the long time average first. So this should be equal to the equilibrium or um, uh, microeconomical value. So, so let's, uh, so we take the time average. So we take this and um, we, um, so this is a sum over all A and B and uh, we integrate over from zero to T and take the long time average, which is this. Okay, so we are assuming no degeneracies at this point, but uh, yeah. Um, that's not too important for the essence of this argument. Um, so, okay, so once you do this integral, uh, uh, these phases are, are, are not going to contribute, I mean, in the long time average. So this is the stationary phase approximation. And then uh, 
eventually what you are going to end up with is just diagonal terms survive. Okay, so you just, uh, uh, so the long time average is given by the diagonal contribution only, which is this. Okay, uh, but this is a paradox, right? I mean, uh, note that you started with some initial state whose linear combination involved these numbers, C A. But uh, you see, you, you take the long time average, then you see, still see that these, it still depends on the details of the initial state. The dependence on the initial conditions is still there. Okay, this is like a paradox. But, uh, uh, but as we saw yesterday, our intuition from classical systems is that you start, it should have mixing in the sense that you start with some initial state. And you, if you go at later times, this, there is complete erasure of the uh, details of the initial state. But that's not happening over here. Right, so this looks like a paradox. But how can we possibly resolve this? How can that possibly equal the microcanonical value? So one way it can happen is that the diagonal matrix elements are smoothly varying with respect to the energy. So the initial state which we had was a sum over states within a small energy window. And if they're smoothly varying, with, um, then this is essentially a constant. Okay, note that when we did this thing from the random matrix example, we saw that the diagonal matrix elements are sharply peaked about the mean. Okay, so if this, uh, each, if each of these diagonal terms are equal to each other, okay, you can essentially factor out this part outside the sign. That's what you can do. So if this is a, if this is a constant, you can factor this out outside the sum. Okay, and then what you're left with is that you have the M O N, and then you have uh, C M squared. And this thing is appropriately normalized. So this is equal to one. Okay. And this, so therefore this quantity is uh, equal to O of E, which is the microcanonical value. All right, so that's one way this can happen. So if the diagonal terms, uh, diagonal matrix elements are close to each other, this is essentially a constant, you can factor it out and then you get the microcanonical value. All right. Um, yeah, so I just uh, wrote this thing over here. Uh, so if this is essentially, this is essentially the mean plus some small deviations and therefore you can factor this part outside the sum and this is what you Okay, so uh, just a reminder. Uh, yeah, okay, just a moment. Yeah, uh, so from the random matrix example, we saw that for the diagonal matrix elements, the mean was this, okay? And the variance or the, uh, which is the small deviations here, these are, actually small, they're suppressed as one over T. So uh, this is, uh, if we take that ansatz for the matrix elements of the operator O, then uh, we are likely to have, uh, we can reproduce the microcanonical. Yes, okay. Yes, yeah, so sh should I think of this as some version of the correspondence principle or something that like the large eigenstate behave typically like classical states and then Beyond some energy, they are all like some classical. Thing. This mixing is a classical intuition, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, in the classical case, we don't really think about energy levels, right? I mean, uh, yeah. I don't know how to make the connection, actually. But yeah, intuitively, it kind of. In, intuitively, you're saying a bio, I'm like, these are all large energy states and they, they all behave the same for typically all operators, right? Right, right. So, yeah, so the diagonal matrix elements, it should be smooth, right? Uh, so, uh, yeah, so the, if, it is, if it is smooth, only then you can, you know, factor out this part outside the sum. And then, uh, yeah. Or you can think of it this way, that this operator is simple enough so that it cannot distinguish between nearby eigenstates. If you have that, then you can factor this out and then you have this. Okay, thanks. Yes. Uh,
Uh, yeah, I means uh, you said like in the case where the this correlation functions E M O E M are close to each other for each eigenvalue. For that, uh, you obtain this sum over C M square equals to one. So the information of C M is you do away with, which I understood that mm. you don't want to retain that information. Mm. But mm. even if the C Ms are retained, why are you calling that it couldn't be a mixed state? Because uh, in a mixed state, it's like uh, there are uh, many possible states with assigned probabilities, right? Means no, no, I'm not saying a mixed state. I'm just saying that the details of the initial state should go away, which is, yeah. I'm not saying, yeah, I'm not. There's nothing related to mixing or uh, not trying to see. This is unitary evolution. So if you, yeah, so if you start out with some pure state, you end up with a pure state again. But yeah, yeah. So when the when this information is lost of the scenes, hmm. that's hmm. when you're saying it's thermalized. Uh, right, 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 right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So then it's not a unitary evolution. No, no, it is unitary. I mean, uh, because you start with some superposition of pure states and then it is unitary evolution. So you know, over here, what I have just done, you see over here, I want to clear this first. Yeah, so this is just unitary evolution, right? I mean, I've done nothing like beyond standard quantum mechanics. And it's, uh, only thing which I'm trying to demand is that these uh, diagonal matrix elements should 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 be sharply picked about the mean. That's it. You know, if you have that, then the you can erase the memory of the initial state. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I see. I see. That's it's, it. okay. So you're yeah. saying even in a unitary process, this is a way we can like uh, exactly delete exactly. the memory kind of stuff. Okay. Exactly, exactly, see, see, exactly. See, see, see. Yes, that that is an that is a important way to oh, yeah okay. nice way to think about it. Yes, because this is going to allow unitary evolution, and even then you can erase the details of the memory. Okay, yeah, of the yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, good. Yeah. Okay. Um, hmm. Okay. So, um, so we looked at this. Um, um, uh, what did I want to say here? Right. Okay. So, um, so the thing is, uh, so now we saw that okay, the details um, um, can be uh, can be erased if if uh, if this was a if this was a constant. Okay, we saw that. Now, but this is the long time average. Okay, so it's an average over long times. So um, this is necessary, but it is not sufficient because we do observe systems which actually thermalize in finite time. Okay, so it, there's, we need something which is stronger. So looking at averages is is uh, not enough. We need something stronger. Okay, so considering averages is not enough, and the expectation value itself should 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 stabilize. So that's this picture which I have over here that the uh, expectation value itself should stabilize around the thermal expectation. Sorry, shall we? Uh... Yes, maybe my internet connection is okay now. Uh, I'll try asking question. It's, uh, I was I was thinking one way in which you can compare this result that you had. Uh, you know, you were trying to ask how can this how can only these diagonal terms compare to this microcanonical answer, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but let's say we picked in this we picked up we picked CMs to be some random initial initially some random coefficients, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then we looked for a measure on the space of all CMs. Okay. And when we compute an expectation value, we integrate over some let's say, uniform measure over all CMs, right? Okay. Then, then, then they would be then it would be close to the microcanonical ensemble. Like at least yeah, but it, but that is by design, right? Because you're designing your initial state such that you make it happen. But what I'm saying over here is much more universal. I mean, it's it's uh, you for any arbitrary choice of CMs, it can approximate the microcanonical. Uh, right, but but I, I would I would have thought that is that is how you'd say you know you've made an art so here you've made a particular choice for CMs, right? But if I That's... take a random choice for CMs and then I and then I integrate over some measure of uh, of possible CMs. Then that's the isn't that a good comparison to do? You do you do that? Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so. 
because um, I mean, you, you're designing your initial state so that it, it is random enough and it's going to forget the memory at later times. But I mean, that is by design. That's already included in what I'm saying. I mean, if you give the diagonal matrix mm. elements to pay this, even with the choice of the CMs, which you are proposing, it's going to work for that as well. So what I'm saying is, yeah, it's, it's more universal than, than a specific choice of CMs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, yes, so we discussed the diag uh, Akhil, yes. Uh, uh, hey, could, could you repeat that comment about the need for long time average? I, I didn't uh, follow okay. it. So. Uh, okay, so, so, so what I'm trying to say is that looking at averages is not enough. Like uh, so if you look at this plot, uh, which was our working definition of thermalization, is that uh, it, it uh, under time evolution, it, it it reaches near the thermal expectation value, um, but um, there are small fluctuations. So at finite time, um, you see thermalization uh, as far as this observable is concerned, All right? You don't need to, uh, looking at averages as something weaker. That's what I'm trying to say. The expectation value itself should uh, relax uh, to a stable value. That's what, uh, so we need something, st a stronger condition. Uh, so I'm confused like this, like if I if I am making measurements over time, so it's a larger compared to inverse level spacing, then yeah, it's yeah. still fine to take a time average and make that statement, right? Yeah, uh, so, so yeah, what I'm trying to say is don't look at averages. Let's look at just the expectation value itself. I mean, and then uh, that's going to lead us to something stronger. Looking at averages is something, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's some, it's, it's no, a what I meant is like, if you, if you observe something over times, which are larger than the inverse level spacing, then it's, it's the, whatever you see is going to be like some kind of time average object, right? Or maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But well, it, it depends on the system, like what are the level spacings and so on, but uh, you want to arrive at something more general. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So, uh, and because of this, since we want something stronger, not just averages, but the expectation value itself should uh, stabilize. So we looked at, uh, we'll, let's look at the time evolution itself. Okay. Of, of this, of this operator. So the time dependence sits over here. And what we want is that um, uh, the off diagonal contribution, which uh, this, this part completely contains the off diagonal contribution. And this should be much smaller compared to this, okay? So this encodes the fluctuations and this comes from uh, the mean, okay? And then this should be much smaller compared to this, okay? So one way to achieve this is that if you have um, these matrix elements to be small and random, so then it just becomes a bunch of phases with random amplitudes uh, and these are going to cancel each other. Okay, so that's one way you can achieve this. So the off-diagonal elements um, can roughly speaking has to be small and random. And then these are random phases, We're just going to dephase, and this contribution is going to be small. Okay, so just a reminder uh, of what we got from random matrix theory, we indeed got the, the mean um, uh, of the off-diagonal elements is zero. So it is, uh, as small as you can imagine. And the variance uh, or the fluctuations about this mean is actually small. So this sort of uh, guarantees uh, uh, that this, this also happens. Okay, so, uh, so now with uh, um, these uh, intuition in mind, um, uh, let's uh, now look at the statement of the IEC optimization hypothesis. So maybe I can finish this part. Um, uh, let me see how many slides I have, uh, but let me tr try to finish this part. And uh, since I have around uh, 15 minutes or, or uh, Shubham, uh, how, much, how much time do I have? 15. Yeah, maybe uh, let me try to finish this part and then uh, let's discuss and have questions. Okay, is that, is that okay? Yeah. 
Mm, okay, so now uh, let's discuss ETH. So this is the idea that uh, again um, you have a mixed state which you can uh, heating up this bottle with fire and then uh, exciting this bottle with using a laser. So this is you have a mixed state over here and a pure state over here. And ETH proposes that the expectation value, the thermal expectation value of a local operator O is going to be the same as the expectation value in the pure state, which is the energy eigenstate, which you created by exciting uh, using this laser. Okay, and as we saw the, the diagonal matrix elements encode the equilibrium values and the of diagonal matrix elements encode the fluctuations. And therefore we need these equilibrium values to be much larger and the uh, uh, fluctuations should actually be suppressed. They should be small. So uh, uh, ETH actually proposes an ansatz for matrix elements of the operator. So what it says is that this is an ansatz for the matrix elements of this operator O so in this energy eigenstate. Uh, sandwich uh, between two energy eigenstates. So the diagonal matrix elements, so this is given by a smooth function, okay, of, of these energies, okay. And uh, this, this is multiplied by an identity matrix. And the off diagonal elements um, are exponentially suppressed by the entropy. And there's also a smooth function um, which depends on the, um, these two energies via the average energy and the difference between the energies, which is this. And uh, RMN is again, uh, these are some, this is a random matrix and each component of the random matrix has zero mean and, and order one variance. Okay, and uh, we arrived at this ansatz from random matrix theory for the matrix elements of the operator O. And you can clearly see that, you know, this is motivated, ETH is motivated by this ansatz. It's a slight generalization because now this, there is explicit dependence on the energies. And there is also this function that depends on the average energy and the differences, but the structure is actually the same. Okay, so that's, 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 uh, main, uh, this was actually the main motivating uh, uh, results uh, uh, behind arriving at the sunsets. Okay, and as usual, one over square root D is, uh, is uh, the end, uh, is, is the exponential of the E to the minus S. Okay, so this, uh, we saw that the diagonal matrix elements, it should give the microcanonical expectation value. So this GMN is the, random, is the microcanonical expectation value, and this is a smooth function. So we have smooth diagonal elements. And uh, this um, F0 um, over here, that um, is a smooth function that encodes the fluctuations. And this RMN is a these are random variables with zero mean and uh, variance one for the GOE or two for the uh, GOE. Okay, so uh, let me mention the, how the notion of temperature arises. So we have this ETH ansatz, but we want to sort of equate, quote unquote, um, uh, the, 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 te the temperature, uh, a mixed state to a pure state. So there should be a notion of temperature of a pure state. Okay? So there should be an effective notion of temperature of a pure state. And the notion of temperature arises uh, when you take this operator O to be the Hamiltonian itself. Okay? So when you take the operator O to be the Hamiltonian, um, you can look at the diagonal matrix element. Uh, so the all diagonal matrix elements are all zero because it, the states are orthogonal. So the diagonal matrix element um, in this in a single pure energy eigenstate is given by this. That's the left hand side, and the right hand side is the thermal expectation of the Hamilton. Okay, so it's just a beta derivative of the partition function. It's like the free energy. Okay, so, uh, so this is just the energy eigenvalue. The states are appropriately normalized and um, this gives you a function of beta and you can solve for beta as a function of EM and thereby get an effective temperature, uh, which is a function of the energy of the pure state. 
Okay, I, I hope uh, this part is clear. Um, I think there's a question in the Yeah, so, chat. so can I take the question? Uh, so, okay, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so this is motivated by uh, expectation from RMT. I already mentioned this. Um, so yeah, so one thing um, is that, um, mm, so we have this ETH ansatz, and um, one reason why uh, we wanted this orthogonal elements to be small and random, we said that uh, it, um, it can be a bunch of random phases uh, and they cancel each other out and thereby uh, it's effect and the, the expectation value terminalizes. It's enough to have it random, okay? So uh, you might think that it's enough to have it random and then you have random amplitudes multiplying phases and thereby there is just dephasing and uh, at later times this, uh, the contribution from this off diagonal elements, they are going to die out. But uh, it isn't just dephasing. You also need the off diagonal elements to be small, okay? And uh, one reason why, uh, why you need it to be small is as follows. So let's look at the fluctuations again. So, okay, so this is the um, uh, expectation value of the operator at uh, O at time T minus the, uh, minus the average. This is the time, uh, the long time average. Okay, so you're looking at the uh, uh, fluctuations at, at, at some finite time. Okay, so if you look at the at the um, uh, at this difference, uh, this contribution over here purely comes from diagonal matrix elements, as we saw earlier. Okay, so the only contribution to the sum comes from off diagonal elements. Okay, now you can think that these um, that these CMs they are appropriately normalized and they are roughly each of them are roughly of the order of yeah. Uh, CM is roughly of the order of one over square root M. So we are just doing um, um, an estimate of how small this of diagonal element should be. So this, um, so we just an order of magnitude calculation over here. So the CMs are appropriately normalized. So they are roughly of this order. So you get this factor over here. So one over N, okay. Now uh, these are random and you have, so this just, comes outside the sum, this part. And these OMNs, they are random and you have uh, some phases with some random amplitudes. So this is like a random walk problem and uh, you have N squared number of terms over here. So uh, this sum actually is given by this numerator. Okay, you can find this. And uh, thereby what you have is that, uh, so this factor cancels with this and uh, what you have for this fluctuation is the typical value of an off diagonal element. All right, so uh, over here, uh, yeah, so over here we approximated uh, the, since the OMNs, they have, uh, they, uh, they have uh, small fluctuations, uh, let's imagine all of them to be close to some typical value. So we can again factor this out of the sum, okay, with some random matrix part. And thereby you see that uh, uh, this is, uh, this fluctuation is given by some typical. Okay, and similarly for the diagonal part, uh, it is given by essentially the, uh, the typical value of the diagonal part. All right, so that's, that's this. So now, uh, since this is going to give the equilibrium value and this is going to give you the fluctuations, uh, you really need the typical value of the off diagonal elements to be smaller than the diagonal elements. Okay, that's, that's needed in order for your fluctuations to be small at, at late times. So yeah, so these are off diagonal elements and you need the off diagonal elements to be of small magnitude compared to the uh, diagonal matrix elements. Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'm going to stop. Yeah, I think this is a good point to stop. Yeah, we can continue again from this place. Yeah, okay, so that's, that's all I have to say for today.
thanks for the attention. Uh, so, uh, Rohit, do you want to ask your question or do you want me to read it out? Okay, I guess I'll read it out. Uh, he's saying um, uh, for, for finite level systems, doesn't this equation give negative beta if you try to solve for beta? I think you're referring to something before. Previous slide, I think. Um, yeah, here. yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't try. Yeah. I'm used to CFTs where you can get something positive. Right. But this sort of thing is what typically done what for the question, the question was for finite level systems, doesn't this equation give negative beta? Uh, actually, you can just uh, see directly by taking a two-level system. I don't know what happens to CFTs, but two-level or any such finite level for finite level system, if you try to solve this, you get a polynomial in beta, which give or like one of the major roots are negative. Yeah. yeah so don't take that route. I mean, work with a good route. I mean. So, <laughs> Why do you want to complicate? I mean, it's just where if you have something positive, work with that. I mean, it's, it's, it's yeah. Okay. If it's a polynomial equation, then it will have several roots. If there is a negative one, there will also be a positive one. I mean, then work, just work with the positive one. Yeah. Yes, it does. Yeah, thanks, Shavik, for that nice start. Uh, I had a question a little bit before where, uh, you know, a little going back to that, where you um, were comparing the diagonal and the off diagonal uh, things. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. You can go back to that. Slide. So you had this, uh, no, uh, no, a little bit later, where, where you were arguing that the off diagonal terms vanish and uh, because you have, a, you have some sort of random phases, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I got a, I got a little confused there uh, because I mean you you explained this a little bit later, but but uh, but I'm just a little confused. So so in, in this off diagonal term, sure there are random phases, but uh, but like you said later, let's say the off type. So let's say this e expectation value of O E M O E N is order e to the minus s by two, right? Yeah. That's what yeah. you said. You said so so then you're taking a bunch of random phases and adding them with this amplitude e to, yeah, the, yeah. to the minus yeah. s by two. So so we we know then that uh, it should scale. Then then this whole term is not zero actually, but it's like square root. It's square root the number of terms times e to the minus s by two. Right. Uh, sorry, I'm not very good at uh, doing calculations in real time, but uh, we can do this a bit uh, slowly. I mean, if you like. So I'm just saying the, the sum of uh, like let's say we had sum of n terms with random phases. Okay. Then uh, I think the sum would be would give us square root n times. Uh, Typical. Let's say they were all had the amplitude, uh, all had the same amplitude. Then, I, then the, then the sum of the terms would be square root n times. Uh, uh, n times. Sum x. Let's say where x is the. Let's say each term was like each term had amplitude x and and phase uh, oh. and some random phase. Okay, so like O O, o M N. Uh, yeah, so I thought. Yeah. Right. So, so I thought your O M N. Right. So I thought your O so, so I thought your OM in typical is is has a size e to the minus s by two. So I would take that to be the amplitude. Like I would take that to be x. And then your n is just the number of off diagonal terms. So so that depends on the dimension of the system. Right? Okay. Uh, and yeah. and then if I multiply these two, I would get a I would get a estimate for what this off diagonal contribution is. Right? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Uh, so, so, so then I got confused about why you said uh, that they have to cancel each other out. Yeah, uh, I was just trying to say that canceling each other is just not enough because, because you see, it's just like a random walk problem. I mean, uh, because uh, if these are, uh, say, just take this to be this almost same as each other, or this is just one over n, because the CMN is one over square root n. 
-hmm. okay so this you can factor it outside the sum and then uh, this is uh, this takes this kind of value or typical times uh, rmn okay. Mm -hmm. okay and then uh, you'll get uh, something because since there are n squared terms over here n squared right. terms my ipad does not work in that region so there, since there are n squared terms so it's a um, sum over uh, it's a random walk problem with with n squared steps so you get a factor of uh, square root n squared right right okay. and eventually if you take all the factors into account what you will see that this part over here it uh, goes as omn uh, its typical value that's right yeah. So uh, let me go to that slide. I see. Um, just to... Yeah, it's here. Yeah. I see. But but uh, even if so, you, so your point in the, in that earlier slide was that. Um, Let's say this off diagonal terms don't contribute, and then the diagonal terms won't be able to reproduce what uh, the micro. Yeah, yeah. So, so the thing is that that um, it, it, so this off diagonal terms contain all the time dependence. Okay. So, and then you are over here. You're looking at the fluctuations. Okay. So you see yeah. that the fluctuations is uh, is more or less equal to a typical value of the off diagonal. We are not assuming exponential suppression yet. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay. So uh, over here, you see that it it, it is the um, uh, these fluctuations are roughly of the order of the of a typical value of OMN. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, on the other hand, the equilibrium value uh, is is given by the typical value of the diagonal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now you, you really need uh, the fluctuations to be small. You want this quantity. This should be small, right? Right. So and therefore uh, it has to obey this 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 thing. Yeah, that's what I'm trying. I see. I see. I see. Yeah, which is nothing but the statement that you know, if you have uh, your ETH uh, matrix elements, I mean the diagonal ones encode to the equilibrium values, whereas mm -hmm. the diagonal ones they encode to the fluctuations, which is this. And uh, these fluctuations need to be small in order for your system to think. So that's that's it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Shavi, could you tell me once again how did you get this one by n states? I am confused about that. Oh, this this one uh, this one comes from these. So I'm assuming that CM uh, they are normalized. The initial state is normalized appropriately. That these CMNs are roughly this one over states. That's all. Shovik, uh, I wanted to ask a little. I was hoping you would say a little more about what what you mean by typical here. Uh, well, it's something which is close to the average. I mean, typical. I mean, is like. I mean, if you some... have the mean and the variance is small, you can approximate uh, an individual element by the mean, and that is. What typical. I see. So, so this is not a. This is not a. This is not something about the operator itself. This is just about. This depends a bit on the operator itself because, uh, yeah, and not not all operators are go, going to obey ETH. I mean, okay. Yeah, this is one. So well, I mean, pre presumably uh, tomorrow you will give yeah, us yeah. some examples. Uh, I think maybe that will be make it clear. Yeah. Is there any other questions? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, uh, what about that paradox you told? Uh, you will solve that tomorrow, or there was any connection with the letter things? Uh, yeah. So you mean uh, this, right? Okay. First, we have to clear this. Dependent on initial parameters. Uh, Siddharth, could you please lower your hand? I'm facing a, a bit of problem to click something on my iPad. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, yes. So the paradox, I think, is solved uh, in the sense that uh, 
Yeah, so I think it was here. So you see, uh, if you look at the long time average, uh, then the off diagonal elements are not going to contribute. And then uh, only the diagonal elements are going to contribute, but they come weighted with these coefficients of the linear combination that appeared in your state. Note that your uh, initial state, psi, it was a superposition of energy eigenstates. Uh, yeah. Um, CA. Um, yeah, so this chat message is coming where I'm writing. So <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's a bit, uh, um, okay. Uh, so, okay, so uh, so this was your initial state, okay? And you see that even if you take the long time average, um, it still contains some memory of your initial state, okay? So this, this CA appears over here. So this is like a paradox at the face of it, okay? So now, now one way to resolve this paradox is that if, since this is a sum over uh, closely spaced states, 